So our program tonight is with Anthony Puccini. Um, he's been with us before. Um, I went back and did the, the, the look back machine, at least via our website. And he, the first time was in 2005. It was on Western Mediterranean vegetable stews. In 2007, it was on spaghetti carbonara. On um, 2012, it was the history of pasta. 2014, jambalaya, congri, and hopping john. And 2019 was the last time Omar l'American, um, probably, of course, due to something called the pandemic. Um, but Anthony studied at Columbia University and Cornell University. He had a PhD in 1992 in Germanic linguistics. He also studied and later conducted research as a Fulbright scholar at the Catholic University of Leuven. Sorry. He taught for many years in various capacities at the University of Chicago, Germanic languages and literature. It's my mother, what can I tell you? Um, and uh, yeah, and his current research focuses on Mediterranean and Atlantic world foodways. Uchidi is a two-time winner of the Sophie Co Prize in Food History, which is via the uh, Culinary Historians of New York. And twice we've been visited by uh, Sophie Co's son, Andrew, who did a program in 2010 on chop suey. And again, in 2016 on the Great Depression. And I've known Tony since at least 20 years now. Who knew? Time flies when you're having fun. Um, and he was part of the, the food community, like Chow Hound and LTH Forum. And we had lots of vigorous conversations over the years about a lot of stuff, which probably doesn't matter now. But at the same time, it was very important, like carbonara, no cream, no peas, you know, uh, puntanesca. It's, that's not puntanesca. But my friend told me it was puntanesca. It's, she's wrong. So. But Tony is always a purist and we always learn a lot. So I'm thrilled that he's here tonight. So Tony, I'm gonna to turn it over to you. Is that okay? And I think you're muted, sir. Because, because when I mute all, it mutes everybody, including you, but you can unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you. Am I coming through? All right. Um, yeah, just a... Uh, uh, a word before I, I start. Um, the material I'm going to present tonight, uh, I'm going to um, uh, basically read a, 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 a paper that is, uh, it's not exactly the text um, that will appear in the, the Oxford Symposium proceedings. It's, um, it's a, a text uh, for a talk, and I, I thought I'd I'd use that, although we have more time here than than uh, <clears throat> I had for my Oxford presentation. So uh, I'll uh, probably do some asides uh, to go into things uh, in a little more detail. Um, <clears throat> and uh, just a, a couple of words about my background that are perhaps relevant to uh, to me uh, uh, talking about. Italian beef. I am not a, a native Chicagoan, but I've lived here for a very, very long time. Um, uh, a good bit over 30 years. And um, <clears throat> much of that time I've lived in the Taylor Street uh, neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> uh, the whole time I've been in Chicago, I've uh, had contacts in the Taylor Street neighborhood. And um uh, so uh, over the years, I've gotten to know a lot of old timers. Um, and uh, some of the um, research for this paper is informed by, um, you know, sort of uh, field work, as it were. Uh, although at the time I was doing it, I wasn't doing it as field work. So it was just conversations with, uh, with friends and, and acquaintances in the Taylor Street neighborhood, which, uh, which gave me a bit more insight into uh, into the topic. Um, I myself am from New Jersey. Uh, originally, uh, I grew up in Northeast New Jersey and uh, New York. 
And uh, <clears throat> that's an area, uh, uh, as, as I'm sure you all know, with a very large uh, Italian American population, uh, um, it's, it's sort of the epicenter for uh, Italian American, uh, the Italian American population. Um, <clears throat> and, and so um, there's a, a, to a remarkable degree, there, there still, um, there's a fair bit of old traditions maintained there, I think a little more so than in Chicago, where in the recent decades, the old neighborhoods have uh, really been broken up. And uh, um, anyway, uh, so um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll go to uh, the matter at hand. Um, so <clears throat> Italian beef or simply beef is a dish which is today made throughout Chicago and its suburbs, but is hardly to be found elsewhere in the US. It thus represents one of the foods that is thought of as a particular specialty of the area. And as it has come uh, to be much celebrated in national popular food media in recent decades, and now has uh, drawn attention thanks to uh, the show uh, on Hulu, uh, The Bear, which I am yet to uh, have seen. Um, Italian beef has become one of a small set of dishes which for many Chicagoans is associated uh, strongly with local identity and civic pride. For tourists, it is considered one of the culinary musts when visiting the city. Nowadays, <clears throat> this preparation is prim primarily a commercial food sold in a wide array of informal restaurants and fast food businesses, including local chains, but it is considered best prepared by small establishments known as beef stands, which specialize in this product and are very often still Italian American owned. Domestic preparation is still carried out in some families, especially those of Italian origin and with ties to the Taylor Street neighborhood of the city, for whom the dish is generally reserved for more or less festive occasions. Now, I'm, for those from Chicago, some of this will uh, be well known and obvious, but not everyone's from Chicago. Um, so, as for the dish itself, uh, Italian beef is always served as a sandwich, of which the filling is a heap of thin slices of roasted beef. At first blush, then, it um, appears to be just a take on the roast beef sandwich, which is found throughout the United States. And consequently, food writers all seem to assume that Chicago's specialty arose simply as an Italianized version of the Anglo-American mainstreams dish, uh, an idea which I uh, hope to show to be quite wrong further on. Chicago's beef uh, sandwich not only has an indisputably Southern Italian origin, but also is in several ways quite distinct from its mainstream analogs, which include the cooking method, the seasoning, the manner of serving, and the canonical condiments. Um, so here's a archetypical French dip sandwich. Um, not, uh, not really uh, very close to Italian beef, note the, uh, the medium rare meat, uh, which is not something that one finds with Italian beef. Um, here's a sandwich uh, made in Hoboken. It's rather famous in the area, Fiore's Deli. And this is, I believe, you know, this is not Italian beef. It is an Italian version of a roast beef sandwich. And it's a very good one uh, made with their in-house made fresh mozzarella and with uh, pickled peppers and excellent bread. Uh, it's a great sandwich, but it's not Italian beef. Uh, incidentally, this deli stands next to an empty lot, which used to be a tenement house where my uh, father and his parents lived uh, back in the early part of the 20th century. To prepare the meat, for Italian beef, one selects a large cut of beef, typically a relatively inexpensive top or bottom round, which is partially trimmed of fat. There are multiple acceptable variations on the cooking method. Some cooks apply dry seasoning to the meat before browning 
uh, drowning it in a large uh, in a large pan with some olive oil. Others uh, forgo the browning and go directly to placing the seasoned meat uh, in an oven. Yet others marinate the meat for a fairly long time in a heavily seasoned broth before roasting in the oven. In all cases, it is absolutely essential that when the meat goes into the oven, there is a substantial amount of seasoned liquid, be it broth or water, in the roasting pan, as this liquid provides the ample amounts of gravy um, that is a, a central feature of the dish. Another key stage uh, in the preparation of Italian beef comes at the end of the oven roasting. Both the meat and the gravy are thoroughly cooled, a step which allows the cook to skim excess fat from the gravy and um, even more importantly, to slice the cooked meat as thinly as possible. In the commercial setting, this slicing is achieved by means of a large electric slicer, while domestic cooks must do the best uh, they can with a knife. After these steps have been carried out, the gravy is reheated and preferably just before serving, the sliced beef is bathed in the gravy long enough for it to get thoroughly drenched and hot, uh, but not uh, so long as uh, to let the meat break down. Of central importance to the character of the dish is of course the seasoning, which always includes aromatic vegetables, especially of the allium family and spices, though in the commercial setting, there is a lamentable tendency to rely on powdered onion and garlic rather than the actual fresh ingredients. In addition to garlic, onion, salt, and pepper, both red hot chili, pepperoncini, uh, usually in flaked form, and dried orega oregano are universally used in commercial kitchens. But many purveyors employ additional seasonings and some regard this aspect of their recipes as a closely guarded secret. Some of these flavorings that I've encountered are rosemary, marjoram, fennel seeds, and paprika. In addition, one finds a less common use of what um, Americans think of as sweet spices, something which I believe is an archaism, and in the commercial sphere is a distinctive and much commented upon practice of the oldest continually operated, operating beef stand in the Taylor Street neighborhood, Al's number one Italian beef. Al's secret seasoning is thought by some to be allspice, but in my judgment, it is surely a combination of cloves and cinnamon, perhaps also nutmeg. And of course, the flavor combination of these three spices together with black pepper is what gave rise to the name allspice, a single spice originally produced only in Jamaica and generally quite alien to traditional Southern Italian cookery. The final preparation of Italian beef sandwiches naturally involves the union of bread, meat, and gravy. The bread for the sandwich is, is traditionally a long loaf of a particular sort called in much of America Italian bread, but referred to by Chicago's Italian bakers as French bread. It is cut in sections and opened book style. There are then three options for the individual eater to choose. One, uh, dry with the meat um, taken from the gravy and briefly drained before placement on the bread. Two, uh, wet with the uh, meat placed on the bread without draining and with additional gravy spooned onto the sandwich. And three, dipped with the composed sandwich dunked for a moment or two into the gravy. And I think that can be seen there. Oh. Obviously, the, the bread of wet and especially dip sandwiches becomes quite soft and the dripping gravy can make quite a mess. And I think that's part of the charm of, of, of the dish. The messy nature of an Italian beef sandwich is usually augmented by the two common additions. One can request the sandwich to be sweet, which indicates that roasted or fried sweet bell peppers should be placed atop the meat. Instead, or in addition, one can request the sandwich to be hot, which calls for the addition of a style of jardiniera, particular to Chicago's Italian-American community. 
This jardiniera is made by taking pickled vegetables, here typically cauliflower, celery, carrot, and hot chili peppers, mincing them up, and then further preserving them in oil, preferably olive oil, producing typically a very piquant condiment. Thus, at a beef stand, one might order as follows, uh, a beef hot and wet, or a beef dipped sweet and hot. Variations on the basic Italian beef sandwich are several and include what is known as a combo, which combines the two main products of an old fashioned beef stand, namely links of grilled Southern Italian style sausage flavored with fennel and the roasted beef. Cheesy beef is surely a more recent variant with sliced low moisture mozzarella or provolone topping the sandwich, reflecting the recent American predilection for adding cheese to almost everything. Far more interesting are the two inexpensive variants which do not contain any actual meat. Um, these are known as gravy bread, which is simply the bread moistened or soaked with gravy, and the famous potato sandwich, which is essentially gravy bread filled with French fries. It should be noted that good beef stands all produce excellent French fries, uh, which are made with freshly cut potatoes and are twice fried in the old Belgian fashion. They constitute the normal accompaniment to an Italian beef or combo. As mentioned above, food writers who have considered the origins of Italian beef all seem to assume that the dish arose in the States as a sort of peculiar Italian take on the Anglo-American roast beef sandwich. This assumption is, a man is manifested in the inclination so common in popular food writing to attribute the origins of recipes to an identifiable individual, an inventor of the dish. And in this effort, multiple owners of beef businesses have been happy to cooperate, claiming that an ancestor of theirs, a couple of generations back in time, uh, who founded their family business was responsible for creating the dish. Beyond such claims, a couple of things are beyond dispute. First, the association of Italian beef with Italians is clear enough. From elements of the dish itself, from the location of the earliest beef stands in the once predominantly Italian Taylor Street neighborhood, and of course, from the name of the dish. But the names and menus of hole-in-the-wall establishments, such as beef stands, are not always readily traced in written records. And indeed, some of them, long closed, exist only in the memories of old residents of Taylor Street. It seems clear that the first such places arose in the years around World War II, either shortly before the war or soon thereafter. It is also the case that some local residents insist that Italian beef was a dish that appeared first as a commercial offering in existing small shops whose original and primary raison d'etre was the making of sausage sandwiches, that is both Italian sausage sandwiches and the particular Italian take on the Chicago style hot dog. <clears throat> Uh, that claims of the invention of the dish by forebears of one or the or the other owner of a surviving beef business are at best spurious is made clear by the occasional references in autobiographical and anecdotal documents related to the Taylor Street neighborhood of an old local institution known as the Peanut Wedding, something which drew my attention many years ago because of its similar similarity to a parallel in my native New York area, namely the football wedding. Um, the football wedding, Francis Ford Coppola incorporates a little element of that in the wedding scene in the first Godfather movie where the, the guards are uh, joking around and throwing sandwiches around that are wrapped up. These jocular terms both refer to a style of wedding celebration that was once common among poor working class Italian American families in the early to mid 20th century, characterized in part by the humble fare served at the receptions. In New York, the main food was Italian submarine sandwich sandwiches wrapped in paper, which could be tossed to guests like footballs. For Chicago's peanut weddings, the local folk etymology claims that roasted peanuts were featured, which is quite possible, but not necessarily um, the full or even correct explanation of the name. 
peanut here may have been more a jocular reference to the overall humbleness of these affairs, where, in fact, the main food served was sandwiches of roasted beef with gravy, that is, Italian beef. Some 16 years or so ago, I became good friends with a baker, the late Frank Macy, proprietor of one of the last of the old neighborhood Italian bakeries of Taylor Street. In exchange for helping out in the shop and filling in for absent employees, Frank taught me how to make all the traditional baked goods featured in his Italian superior bakery. Various kinds of bread, um, excellent pan pizza, frizzel, taral, uh, all great things. <laughs> and over the years, we had many conversations about our shared Neapolitan foodways and about Taylor Street in the old days. Frank's parents came uh, to the U.S., first to New York, from a small town just northeast of Naples in 1912, and they opened their own bakery in Chicago in 1926, where Frank started to work already as a small child, along with his siblings. One of the most interesting and important parts of the history of Italian beef, something hitherto unnoted in any discussions of the dish, I learned from him. According to Frank, for decades, the bakery regularly was involved in the production of Italian beef for large social gatherings for the local Italian American community, including events such as weddings and anniversaries, but did so in a now curiously old fashioned way. The family or families organizing the events would prepare the beef in their home kitchens and bring the meat in large uh, oven pans for slow roasting in the bakery's large oven. Such events were good business for the bakery, which would be paid for the roasting and then also supply large numbers of long loaves of the so-called French bread with the beef and bread ultimately being served as beef sandwiches at the site of the event, which might be held in a large rented venue or at a home. Though Italian beef is now commonly thought of as a fast food, bought and consumed on the go for a quick meal, the dish remains for many Chicagoans, and especially those of Italian descent, also a quintessentially festive dish for large informal gatherings. Though the peanut wedding is now but a fading memory, Italian beef is an extremely popular food for all sorts of social gatherings, such as office parties, birthday celebrations, watching the Bears or other Chicago sports teams in important games, et cetera. If the gathering is not too large, some, especially Italian-American families, might well make their beef in the home kitchen, but one notes that virtually all commercial kitchens producing Italian beef offer both small and very large catering kits of beef, gravy, bread, peppers, jardiniere, packed and ready for final assembly wherever customers care to have their celebration. Um, there's another beef stand from Taylor Street on Taylor Street uh, and note the date uh, of its establishment 1948 as I mentioned before the old beef stands uh, the, the first wave of them came just before and just after uh, World War II and the patio is one of them Now, despite its key role as a source of Italian influences on mainstream American cuisine and thence on global culinary trends, Italian American cookery is remarkably misunderstood by both scholarly and popular food writers who routinely confuse the highly adapted, I call them Italianoid dishes of commercial kitchens and pseudo Italian. Uh, television chefs aimed to satisfy the tastes and meal structures of non-Italians with the actual cookery of Italian Americans. This genuine style of cookery is like the heritage language varieties of the old Italian American communities, now moribund and in many places quite dead as the process of cultural assimilation has transformed actual Italian Americans, that is Italian immigrants and their descendants who maintain to a noteworthy degree old world cultural traditions into simply Americans of Italian descent, 
who perhaps still bear Italian names, but are from a cultural standpoint, thoroughly American. Members of this latter fully assimilated group might develop a nostalgic appreciation of their heritage, and they might uh, have maintained uh, certain holiday traditions, typically. But they cannot undo the break in the generational transfer of linguistic and culinary tradition, the things one can only acquire through long exposure in an intimate and culturally rather homogeneous and closed environment. Italian-American family and community structures long provided such an environment. From the period of the Great Diaspora, from roughly 1880 to 1924, up till around the Second World War, but then gradually at the community level, but, ra but rather abruptly at the individual level, these structures began to break down. The ethnic mixing of the war itself, post-war educational and economic opportunities, and the urban upheavals and mass movements into ethnically mixed suburbs were mechanisms that at once, at the same time, brought about the spread of Italian American influence into mainstream society, while at the same time sowing the seeds for the dissolution of both culturally tight knit Italian American families and communities, and ultimately also the death of Italian American linguistic and culinary traditions. Chicago's Terra Street neighborhood started in the late 19th century as an ethnically mixed immigrant slum on the south edge of downtown, really Printer's Row area. But in time, its population expanded westward in a narrow band as older ethnic groups moved out following Polk and Taylor Streets primarily. By the 1920s, the core of the neighborhood, stretching from around Halstead Street to Western Avenue, was predominantly working class Italian. And though these Italians were of mixed regional backgrounds, the most prominent group from a cultural standpoint was from Campania, including Naples, with a very prominent group from a cultural standpoint, uh, with a very, pro uh, okay, the, 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 the culturally dominant group uh, was from Campania, including Naples, with a very strong contingent from a small city of Acerra, uh, just northeast of Naples itself. I've, uh, I know uh, families from other towns in this general area as well, Mariano, Nola, and the aforementioned Frank Macy. His family was from a small town, San Vitaliano, which uh, is just slightly east of uh, Mariano on the map there. The Taylor Street neighborhood served as precisely the sort of place um, where the aforementioned families and community structures were dense and supported the maintenance of old world cultural traditions to a considerable degree, up until a series of targeted urban renewal projects replaced large swaths of residential properties with public institutions in the course of the 50s and then especially the 60s, forcing much of the Italian population to flee to various suburbs. Italian beef started not as a commercial fast food, but as a festive dish for working class families. Um, and in this, it, it's a remarkable cultural relic from when Taylor Street was a poor Italian enclave with a strong Neapolitan cultural element. And to understand the dish's history, its socioeconomic and socio-culinary aspects are of paramount importance. As a central point of a, an especially productive agricultural zone and capital of one of Europe's largest kingdoms for many centuries, uh, Naples has a particularly rich culinary culture, which includes a style of elite cookery with its international connections, and also a very traditional non-elite style of cookery, very firmly rooted, of course, in local food production, but obviously open to influences from higher up the socioeconomic scale. Influences which logically would be manifested almost exclusively in the festive cookery of the non-elite. If one considers the popular cookery of Naples and more generally of the Mezzogiorno, the south of Italy, one sees that meat and most especially beef plays a, a, a very limited role. 
um, which there, as elsewhere in Europe, reflects the usual high cost of meat and the considerable poverty of the southern Italian masses that obtained until recent times. For most of these people, large pieces of muscle meats were at most to be enjoyed on special occasions, with the protein, fat, and flavor of meat being obtained more routinely in the form of organ meats. And uh, here uh, one thinks of uh, the institution of carne cotta, um, which were, uh, it was a street food. They'd have big vats of uh, cooked up uh, tripe, sometimes other beef organs um, with small bits of, of you know, trimmings of uh, muscle meat. And one could order the tripe or the other um, solid uh, parts of this uh, concoction, or one could order um, a bowl of the soup, the gravy. Another famous dish of this sort is zufrit or zuppa forte, something which uh, people in Jersey were still making uh, uh, when I was a kid. And it's a, a, an awful stew uh, made from pig's puck, so heart, lungs, esophagus, etc. Now, the vast majority of traditional Southern Italian recipes for muscle meats have two central features. First, they typically involve preparations and cooking methods that can render tough cuts of meat quite tender. And second, they all stretch the nutritional and flavor value of the meat by producing ample amounts of either a broth or a sauce to be enjoyed with the local staple foods, namely bread and pasta. Um, Yeah, if you think about it, you know, a, a roast beef, a roast anything aside from lamb, which is a, a holiday dish, is quite rare in the south of Italy. Um, when I talk about uh, cuts of meat that are rendered tender through either long, slow cooking or pounding or chopping, think of the archetypical uh, Southern Italian and Italian-American uh, dishes that involve sausage meatballs uh, or uh, in the old days uh, a meatloaf basically uh, just a large meatball um, uh, also brajol thin slice of meat pounded out and stuffed rolled up and then cooked in a sauce for a long time now <clears throat> the two most prized meat preparations of neapolitan popular cookery uh, are without doubt uh, the famous ragu alla napolitana, um, which uh, is both typically both pork and beef, large pieces, but cooked for a long time with uh, uh, aromatic vegetables, herbs, uh, tomato, and uh, usually typically also involves uh, brajol and meatballs and a piece of sausage. Um, the other one is less well known uh, outside of Campania, but it's uh, the equally delicious carne alla Genovese, um, which is, uh, again, uh, pieces of meat cooked um, typically with very little or no tomato, uh, but a huge amount of onions, and the onions are cooked a long time with the meat, so they pick up the flavor of the meat and they ultimately dissolve. In both cases, the ragu and the, the Genovese produce uh, a two-course meal. Pasta dressed with the, in the case of the ragu, the tomato sauce. Um, in the case of the Genovese, the onion sauce. And then the second course with the piece of meat. <clears throat> now, with this in mind, let us consider the following recipe, which appeared in the second edition of uh, the extraordinary book on Neapolitan cookery um, written by Ippolito Cavalcanti, a high nobleman, uh, native Neapolitan, with a keen interest in the cookery of his native city, both elite and non-elite. Most of the work describes the former, the high-class cooking, and is written in Italian. 
But he also includes a section of popular home style cooking of the broader population, which he wrote in the Neapolitan language. The recipe simply called stufato opens with a brief description of appropriate top and bottom round cuts for the dish and then continues. I'll, I'll read it in the Neapolitan. Mietterà e rindenutiana una fella dell'arda pesata. La cebola felata. E in gobe punci miette la carne con la sale, pepe, tutte spiezie, lo spicchio d'ai e si te piace. Lo ferrai e soffrire buona buona. E ogni intanto non ci metterai una bocca d'acqua. Votana sempre. Quando vede che la carne si è fatta rossa rossa, non ci metterai l'acqua per farlo brodo che ti può servire per i macaroni, per la pasta menuta, per la zuppa e per il succo buono. In English, roughly, uh, you'll put into a casserole a slice of pounded lardo, a sliced onion, and on top then put the meat with salt, pepper, all spices, emphasis added, a clove of garlic if you like, then gently fry it well, and every now and again, you'll add a little water, always mixing it. When you see the meat is well browned, you'll add water to make the broth, which can be served with macaroni, with tiny pasta, as soup, and for whatever you want. Well, there are a couple of things uh, I'd like to point out. I, I, this, is, this is, in essence, Italian beef. There are some small differences. Uh, pounding out lardo does not seem to be something that's been preserved, uh, certainly not in the commercial uh, beef world. Um, but uh, in fact, in Neapolitan cookery and generally in the South, um, you know, we think nowadays olive oil, olive oil, olive oil. But uh, the South of Italy and especially the city of Naples has always been, uh, the cookery has always been mixed, lard and olive oil, and they have their functions. Something else to note is um, the, the phrase, I think, is quite charming, a clove of garlic, if you like, which points to the fact that, um, this is a general fact, uh, that uh, in the United States, Italian recipes have uh, have tended to pick up ever increasing amounts of garlic. Um, when I think back to the milieu in which I grew up, my family, my extended family, friends' families, um, there were dishes that that used a lot of garlic, but most dishes didn't. There was maybe a little garlic, and this uh, old recipe reflects the the uh, the uh, rather restrained use of garlic. Um, Commercial Italian beef, I think now, is quite quite garlicky. Um, no, too, there's no hot pepper here, although I, I'm sure there were uh, Neapolitans and Acciaresi who uh, would put in hot pepper. Pepperoncini is very much a strong element of popular Italian, uh, Southern Italian cookery. Um, and... Uh, uh, yeah, no, to the, 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 there are no uh, uh, dried herbs put in. And um, for various reasons, a topic for another day, um, dried oregano, which is definitely used in Southern Italian cookery, but reserved for certain specific applications. Um, and it tended to get expanded in use uh, here in the States. But um, yeah, this is Italian beef. Now, very similar recipes for substantial pieces of meat cooked in the presence of liquid are known throughout Italy and beyond, albeit under different names. Stracotto, brasato, fricando. And this kind of dish often includes the aforementioned sweet spices of cloves, cinnamon, nutmeg, alongside black pepper. Cavalcanti's inclusion of the compound word tutte spiezie, spiezie, normally uh, written together as one in Neapolitan lexicographical works as tutta spiezia, surely refers to the combination of the three sweet spices ground, a melange that was available commercially in shops of the time 
And that practice uh, was also found in France, where the melange was referred to similarly as tout épice or quatre épices. Note too that in Cavalcanti's Neapolitan language recipe for La Genovese in a later edition of 1852, he includes as an ingredient tutta spiezia. The relationship between the Neapolitan Stufato and Chicago's Italian beef is clear. And while the family behind Al's beef, uh, Al's beef stand can hardly be said to have invented the dish, they are to be celebrated for maintaining the old manner of seasoning the dish. That is otherwise receding not only um, from the commercial beef business, but from local domestic cookery as well. The common uh, assumption that Italian beef is in origin an Italian take on the Anglo-American roast beef sandwich is proved wrong, not only by the very different manner of traditional seasoning, but also by the central importance of the production of a large amount of thin gravy to serve, as Cavalcanti says, Penso que bois, uh, as you like, which in Chicago, or perhaps already in Naples and Acerra, included a large piece of bread. Finally, we, uh, we must note the socio-culinary role of Italian beef, which, though now being regarded primarily as a portable fast food, still retains its festive association as a food appropriate for large social gatherings, even ones of considerable importance. In this way, Chicago's Italian beef evokes the special place that such meat dishes held in the cuisine of the non-elite classes of Naples and more generally of the Mezzogiorno, who were driven by poverty to emigrate to America where they celebrated their humble peanut weddings with gravy drenched beef sandwiches. Thank you. Thank you. I know we have some comments in the chat. Um, maybe we'll start with that because I don't see exactly. Um, let me look. It was uh, Ron Mentagna. Do you want to unmute yourself and maybe share your comments? No, you have to. Uh, oh, you also need to unmute yourself. Hold on. Let me. You have to also you have to unmute. I've got it. Okay, I think I great. did. Yeah, yeah, I was relating yeah. to the uh, peanut uh, comment uh, that it was, you know, serving peanuts, having attended several of them in the 40s, uh, late 40s. Uh, they were they were um, basically mom said, hey, when your uncles get married, we're going to go to the peanut wedding. And it was definitely roast beef. It was uh, wrapped up. Maybe they called it the football. Uh, there was wine and then there was cannoli cake. Uh, layered uh, and soaked in rum. And it was amazing. We never thought of it as cheap, but mom said, your uncles couldn't afford a real big wedding. One of them did, married well. But beyond that, on the west side of Chicago, peanut wedding was that. And and then I also related uh, in the other chat, you missed uh, neck bones. Neck bones are really... Um, slow braised, one of the foods that uh, the West Siders would have that are a treat. And I, I make now, I mean, <laughs> I don't need to buy prime rib. I could afford it, but I, I love to spend two bucks on some uh, pork neck bones. Now it's not kosher, but it's delicious. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh... I didn't mention neck bones, but I didn't mention lots and lots of things. Oh yes, uh, I know. I wasn't. I wasn't trying to cover everything. The, no, no. Your, but, your, but, your no, presentation was wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, but that's an excellent point, um, and a great example of what um, uh, Italian uh, American uh, communities um, ate, and uh, this, and of course coming to the United States and earning vastly more than they did. That, some, something like 80% of the immigrants to the US were from uh, Southern Italy. So from, and when we say Southern Italy, that's Campania, Southern Lazio, Abruzzo, Morise, 
um, Sicily, uh, Calabria, and Sicily. There weren't so many people from Puglia. There were some in the early, in the big wave. Um, Puglians and more Calabres came after World War II. But uh, in any event, those areas are all part of the old kingdom of the two Sicilies that was uh, invaded and annexed to the kingdom of Italy quite unhappily. Um, it was a great, a great deal of social, political, and economic upheaval. And that's part of the impetus for um, emigration. Um, as well as more broad economic issues. But a, a majority of the people were, um, were uh, from, uh, they were poor agricultural workers with little or no land. And, uh, and for the rest, um, uh, mostly the lower classes of urban centers like Naples and Palermo. Um, so they were poor. And that's the, the one of the important things about this dish, the great preservation of a tradition at Al's is this spicing and it, that it spices were not an everyday thing. It was, a, it was something special, something expensive. And a big piece of muscle meat was expensive. It was special to put your teeth into a chunk of meat was something really special. Otherwise it was neck bones. It was, uh, Tsufrit, the, 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 the pig gut stew, uh, things like that. And, and things that I grew up with, actually, uh, they were still made. Uh, Gabutzel, uh, a split sheep's head, um, uh, dressed and, and baked in the oven. Um, th these were, these, you know, it, you could eat, uh, you know, in that style quite, quite frugally in the U.S. where you had much more purchasing power. But but then you see with that purchasing power comes, you know, the the association of Italian Americans with steakhouses. They're, those steaks made in you know southern Italy. But when they came here, yeah, that was that was something they could do. And and of course the proliferation of pasta instead of once a week eating it, you know, anytime you want. Um, but uh, but Italian beef really encapsulates between the spices and the fact that it's a big chunk of beef. Um, this this was celebratory cookery. This wasn't fast food. This was special cookery. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. There's got to be some more questions. Ann Fisher, I thought maybe you could uh, unmute and tell us your story. Oh, sure. there you are, Ann. Hi, hi. Here I am. Um, boy, I could just listen to you all day, Tony. <laughs> I just, I, I love this. I love this good so much. You. <laughs> you introduced us to so much good food in Chicago and so many great stories. And Thank I, you. I Thank just you. love it. Um, yeah, I'll tell a story um, about that was inspired by the neck bones comment. Um, and I can tell you the guy's name because his name is on a class action lawsuit in the federal district court. A guy <laughs> named Frank Bogart. Um, who grew up in the western suburbs, um, developmentally disabled, pretty high functioning. Um, but after his parents died, as happened to developmentally disabled adults of that generation, he went into a nursing home um, and lived in a nursing home for decades and decades. Um, I was part of this class action suit in which he was our named plaintiff, seeking to get developmentally disabled adults out of nursing homes and into community placements. And you know, of course he had to be deposed and you know, they put him in a room with a bunch of lawyers and the tape recorder going, why do you wanna get out? I wanna get out because I used to cook with my mother, I wanna cook. Um, and so sure enough, we had a settlement in the lawsuit. He got out maybe three or four months after he was in his own apartment in Chicago he invited a group of the lawyers and paralegals over to his house and he served us neck bones and gravy, which was in fact neck bones and a lot of tomato sauce that he'd been cooking all day and served over pasta. And it was just, he was so proud. He was so happy. It was just exactly for him as what meant independence. It meant home. It meant control of his own life. And it was the neck bones. I don't think I'd ever had pork neck bones in my life but they were pretty well close to sacred pork neck bones. Yeah. 
Um, you know, that reminds me that uh, something uh, I wanted to uh, mention in an aside while I was uh, uh, reading the paper, but uh, great that uh, both you and uh, Mr. Montagne uh, mentioned the, uh, the uh, gravy um, tomato sauce with neck bones. Um, this cookbook uh, that I uh, found this recipe in for what I, I think we could just call it Italian beef, stufato. Um, the, the author, uh, Ippolito Cavalcante, he wrote, uh, I don't know, seven or nine editions of this book, um, La Cucina Teorico Pratica. And he uh, would make ch rather drastic changes from one edition to the other. He didn't just put out the same book over and over again. And sometimes uh, it's format uh, primarily that changes. Uh, sometimes it's um, uh, details of the recipes. Now, the the recipe that I had up on the screen there was from the second edition, which is uh, 1841. The first edition was uh, 1839. Um, uh, in a couple, at least a couple of the other editions. I haven't seen them all. They're not, not all readily available. I've seen four of them, I think. Um, in other ones, this exact same recipe, um, there's there's a, a, a kind of a fork in the road in making the, the, the dish. And you can go either of two ways. You can do it as uh, cited, uh, as explained in the, in the recipe I cited there. Uh, so you just add water little by little and then a bunch so that you make this broth and you can eat, put your, put the broth over your macaroni along with grated pecorino cheese. That would be the normal way to do it or Parmesan. Uh, but for poor people, it would be pecorino. Um, but uh, in uh, a couple of the additions, at least, uh, there's the choice rather than putting water in, to put tomato in. And he says, if the tomatoes are in season, put fresh tomatoes in. Or if they're not in season, you can put conserva and, uh, or strat or whatever, uh, some you know preserved kind of tomato. Um, and uh, that got me thinking. Now, my, my grandmother, who was a, a wonderful cook, she was, uh, her family was from, not Naples, um, a little bit further south. But she also, in part, learned her cookery from a woman who had worked in the, a kitchen of a nobleman in um, Naples. So she she had a great repertoire of high, low, mid uh, Neapolitan cookery. In any event, she she there was that tomato sauce she made. Now she didn't put uh, 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 cloves in it. Um, but uh, but just with a piece of beef, and that was different. That was a different sauce that was called meat sauce. And that was different than ragu. And ragu is a big involved deal for special occasions with multiple kinds of meat, um, with the brajol and meatballs and all this stuff. It's a lot of work. Um, and that would be more for a holiday occasion, but for a good proper Sunday uh, the dream of poor uh, Southern Italians was always macaroni e carne, macaroni and meat, and that was the sun. That was a Sunday thing. Um, so actually, this, so Italian beef, in a way, is 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 um, you see this bifurcation uh, between the old what pre-Columbian uh, way of uh, using uh, beef to make broth to flavor macaroni, and that's attested already in the first real European cookbook of uh, which is from Naples. Uh, uh, well, the first one after Apicius, um, the Roman, you know, classical Roman period. Um, the Liber de Coquina, which was written in Naples in the Angevin period round about uh, uh, 1300. And there are already recipes there for macaroni with beef stock and cheese. And then, you know, post Colombian, then the tomato creeps in. So uh, we have a 
they, it's so nice to see you, Anne, really. Yeah. Uh, she now lives in the UP. Oh. So there's no chance of accidentally bumping into her here in Chicago presently. So uh, Peter Regas, the pizza historian, he says, I'm confused why we don't see more examples of the old Cam Campania dish in other Italian American Campania communities. If they all had a common origin, why is Chicago so different? Mm. Uh, th that's a good question, but alas, I, I, I'm not sure it, it really has a satisfactory answer. Um, you know, why something survives in one place rather than another. Um, we know that it was made elsewhere. There's a, there's a, uh, something very similar anyway. Um, there's a recipe in a, an early Italian American cookbook um i forget what the date is i think in the 1920s by a woman and i at the moment i don't have her name on the tip of my tongue but um i ha I, I have it here somewhere but uh ba -ba -ba -ba. in any event um where she uh talks about the italian way of making roast beef and uh and she makes a uh, very much a point that it, crucial to it is that you make a lot of this broth gravy. And she actually says the word gravy. I think she was from the New York area. Uh, Gentile maybe was the name. Um, in any event, it was present. I think in Chicago, you know, it may be just the fact that it, uh, it got supported through this institution of the peanut wedding. And uh, that local custom, I think, held, um, uh, and, and this goes back to Mr. Mont Montagna's uh, comment, um, it, it held beyond the time when, they, then, when the uh, Italians of Taylor Street were so desperately poor that they, they couldn't possibly afford, um, you know, a, a wedding catered. Um, it became a neighborhood institution, and I, I think that's probably what what uh, what advanced it here, rather than you know in a place like New York or New Jersey, where you know the um, things just happen to take a different route. Um, beyond that, I don't know what to say. But that that Gentile cookbook does point to the dish being. Uh, known elsewhere in, in among Italian Americans. Um, uh, and, you know, I don't know if you, you know, if you came back in uh, 50 years from now, maybe Italian beef will have a, evolved to a point where, you know, you can't recognize it um, as, as having any relation yeah. to uh, Neapolitan cookery. But uh, I, I think it's on that way. But, uh, but, you know, again, Al's, um, Al's and this precious bit of information that I got from Frank Macy at the bakery uh, about the bakery cooking it for home cooks. Um, uh, that makes the that makes the uh, that makes the connection back to the uh, recipe in Cavalcanti, uh, I think, very, very strong. We have a, a question here from David Reinhardt, who I've asked to unmute. Um... Hello. From Champaign, Illinois. Thanks a lot for your interesting talk. Thank you. One of the uh, things I'm generally interested in is how people connect to traditions or cultural heritage, particularly through food. So I was wondering if you have examples of presenting this information or talking to Italian Americans about this information and if you have an understanding of how it changes how they connect to the past or if it gets them more interested in the food as a traditional item or anything related to that. Uh, I, I, I have not had the opportunity to do that uh, in this particular case. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I mentioned this in the paper. I, I, I make a distinction between, 
I, you know, other term, terms might be better, but um, Italian American, which I see as, you know, what I grew up as uh, in a, a very Italian milieu, American, but, you know, when it came to certain things, most especially food, it was, uh, uh, you know, we, we lived in another world, you know, um, yeah. uh, and um, so the distinction between Italian Americans who and people who have the cuisine, um, who learn it uh, in that intimate setting, eat the same foods on a on a daily, weekly basis. Uh, they almost always have at least some um, Italian, some the 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 heritage language. There's something. They might be terminal speakers, but they have something here on on Taylor Street. I I've noted that that uh, the people who grew up with um, uh, a cuisine sort of, uh, you know, essentially like what I grew up with, um, they are always at least terminal speakers. Now, what is a terminal speaker? It's a linguistic term. Um, uh, somebody who doesn't control the grammar of the language, but has a, a fairly large vocabulary, variable, you know, how much, um, the vocabulary will typically be strong in certain semantic fields. Um, and they typically also have an excellent accent. Um, but they, they can really only produce phrases, maybe songs, maybe prayers. Um, uh, they can't converse in that they don't control the grammar. At best, it comes out sort of grammarless pigeon. But they're at least that. That that's the last generation, that mm -hmm. that, um, um, and I oppose them to uh, Americans of Italian descent, who are just Americans with some Italian input, mm -hmm. um, but they didn't grow up. And I think you know the cuisine in a way, you acquire it like a language. To really know a cuisine, you you live it every day, um, and Italians are famous for this. We talked about food all the time. That's part of it. Um, but, you know, given the social structures of the United States, um, uh, you know, people moving away, not living together with their grandparents or, or, or far from the grandparents, et cetera, et cetera, all uh, mixed marriages, which don't necessarily kill a tradition, but often do. Um, and I, I find uh, speaking with Americans of Italian descent, they're very eager, they want to connect but um, uh, you know they just they they don't know it's they're Americans it's just all it's all strange except for typically a small set of holiday recipes, mm. which in a way are kind of the they're they're very important I, I don't mean to kind of you know no, they're not important they're important but they're not really the mark of 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 uh, of somebody really being steeped in a in a cuisine in a culture it's you know it's the pasta fazul uh, pasta cheech um uh, scungil of the conch salad bacala these these dishes that were everyday dishes that were you know you know that 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 fit into there were certain days we would eat meat. There were certain days we would eat pasta. There were certain days we would eat soup. It was, it was a very complex culture. And so when I first went to, uh, to meet my cousins in Italy, uh, this is a long time ago, but I, I was amazed. They were amazed too. We ate the same things. They thought, oh, so you eat hamburgers. I said, no, and I eat pasta fazul and pasta gich and bacala and uh, gabuzel and you know, all these things. They were, they, they like um, couldn't believe it. And uh, Italian American families, uh, uh, you know, especially with, you know, in dense areas, Taylor Street was like that for a long time, but then got, you know, kind of broken up. But in places like, you know, parts of Brooklyn, um, parts of Jersey, parts of uh, the, where these communities have really stuck together. There are still families that are 
you know, that keep a lot of the tradition around because, you know, here's grandma cooking. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, it's uh, the, the youngest generations now, I, uh, they're very enthusiastic, but it's part of that sort of global interest in food. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've noticed this too, that um, a lot of Americans of Italian descent, they want to reconnect, but then they reconnect with Northern Italian traditions that have mm -hmm. nothing to do with what their family did. Right. Um, uh, and in fact, there, you know, in the, for a long time, there was a lot of shame put on Italian Americans, uh, that we were uncouth barbarians who we, we couldn't even speak our own language. So, you know, growing up and still, I say brazut for prosciutto. I say pasta vazul and not pasta fagioli. Oh, there's nothing, that's not a bastardization, that's not incorrect. That's our language, Neapolitan, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I, I learned Italian at school. Uh, you know, right, it's a right. different language, uh, closely related. But um, so a lot of, uh, you know, uh, people of my generation, a lot of them actually started to be ashamed of aspects mm -hmm. of Italian-American culture, including food aspects, mm -hmm. which is shocking because Southern Italian Food is glorious and has glorious tradition. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Sure. So we have a question from, uh, let me take care of that. Uh, we have a question from Carrie Shug. He said, so the often repeated story is myth that Italian beef originated from wanting to serve a prime rib at weddings for prestige, but with the beef getting so thin, it was then put on bread. Yeah, I, I I don't think there were a lot of Taylor Street families buying prime beef, a prime rib. <laughs> you know, um, no, I don't think there's anything to that story. You know, that popular food history is filled with these like kind of amusing stories that um, uh, you know, it's like spaghetti alla carbonara. There's this story that it was invented in Rome because GIs were there in World War II and there was very little to eat. And so the GIs would bring their eggs and bacon and the Italians would cook it up with spaghetti. I mean, this is a ridiculous story in all sorts of ways. That, you know, these are, you know, these are these sort of just so stories that, uh, that kind of plague uh, food history. Um, so, yeah, yeah, but they, they get repeated so often it becomes the truth. Absolutely. And here I am to combat them. Yes, you are. <laughs> um, I'm going to read something from Sarah Rovin. Um, she says, I was just reading about Kulant, the Shabbat stew. The wife would prepare her pot of the meat and vegetables at home, but then would take it to the town's bakery and leave her pot in their oven along with the other village's women uh, from Friday later afternoon to Saturday lunch when it was eaten. I like this common element of the people bringing personal food to a bakery for their low and slow oven. Oh, cholent, not coolant. I got it. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah, I, in, um, in uh, earlier, you know, for us now, like what house doesn't have a stove, but um, with an oven in it, but um, uh, in uh, Europe, both urban and rural, lots and lots of houses did not have um, an oven. So lots of, you know, and when I say oven, well, you, there were other things that you could do, you know, these these sort of uh, Dutch ovens where you put the coals on top as, and have the flame underneath. You could bake things that way. But a, a proper like bread oven, uh, very few people had. Um, uh, Frank Macy uh, told me, the, the baker I, I referred to, Italian superior baker, he told me that his family in Italy, they had an oven, a stone oven outdoors. Um, and so everyone, all their neighbors would bring their loaves to them to bake. 
and uh, and that's sort of they weren't really bakers it wasn't a professional baking family they were farmers but that's sort of how they got the idea to be to be bakers in the u.s um that was a very common thing and um and in for italian americans uh, you know uh, and this would be true for jews and poles and others in back in the days of mass immigration living in tenements those tenements were had were bare bones small and bare bones um minimal cooking facilities and typically you know i guess in a lot of cases no oven and so this was still a common thing in the case of the italian beef maybe they had an oven at home but it wasn't big enough to to deal with uh making uh, italian beef for 50 people but um but yeah that's a that's an old tradition um in europe that uh i guess it's good that it's gone but uh, it's nice to have an oven uh jo judy points out she goes it wasn't about having or not having an oven according to jewish law you were not allowed to do the work of heating on shabbat and that's why it was taken <laughs> to the bakery and then it was brought home in time for shabbat lunch well uh, that so was their taken to a to a to a christian-owned bakery i, I gather because, probably yeah well that's yeah that's a little bit different right um by the way uh I know you're a linguist and I know you're very specific. Apicius. Is that how you, is that your preferred pronunciation of that name? Because I've heard another one recently. Uh, what was the other one you heard? Ap I'm going to try to do it best I can. Apicius? Uh, yeah. Uh uh i i i know i don't i don't have any i've been saying apicia so I, i'm in your camp but i was just curious because i know as a linguist you're very specific sometimes yeah in classical latin um uh uh what is spelt with a c was always pronounced like a like a k a k so in classical latin it was apicius um but um at some point in the so-called uh vulgar latin and on into the romance languages the k uh, before a front vowel or i or an e got uh was changed to uh to uh ch or tz. so um apicius uh i don't know i uh, I don't I don't speak Latin much anymore. Uh, but <laughs> um, I guess if I were speaking with uh, Cicero, I'd say Apicius. It's in Cicero in here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if I go to Cicero, I speak, I say Apicius. In Berlin, though, I say Apicius. And on Terra Street, I say Apich. <laughs> oh, really? There's yet another pronunciation. Oh, well, in we Italian. You know, Italians pronounce Latin as if it's Italian because it is. It's old Italian, so uh, they they say uh, apicia. So I don't know if this is politic to ask, but I'll ask anyway. You don't have to answer. How's that? Do you have a favorite Italian beef place in Chicago? I do, and it's it's Al's, and it's because of the the their peculiar, but I think nice traditional old-fashioned uh, spicing which uh i don't know if they're the only place that does that anymore but um they they might be the um but there are a lot of great beef places um uh it took the yeah the patio actually makes a very good beef sandwich but their french fries are not up to snuff um you know of course johnny's and there you can get a you can get a good beef sandwich you know I'm not a snob about it, but I I prefer I prefer Al's. Uh, I prefer a combo, a combo dipped, hot and sweet. That's my favorite. And we had Pat Scala years ago who did not like the combo. He says either you get an Italian beef sandwich or you get the Italian sausage sandwich, but you don't put them together. But you know, it's again just his opinion. Like it's yours. Yeah, I could see that, but the, his his company just makes the beef, right? They don't make the sausages. <laughs> and you know, and you know what? I don't think the company exists anymore. Uh, there was I've a claim that they were the originators of Italian beef, which you know, I mean, there, there are a lot of people have claimed that, um, and Al's claims it too. Um, and in some of my um, informants, as it were, 
in, in the Taylor Street neighborhood, um, you know, I'd ask him, so uh, Owls is uh, the oldest one. And he said, no, nah, no, nah, there were other places around. Um, uh, I know there was another one before World War II that was around uh, right by me on, on Taylor, Taylor and Western, um, Car Carmies, um, that served Italian beef at roughly the same time that, that uh, Owls opened up. But Al's could be the first place that made it a fast food. I don't know. I, I'm not going to gainsay them, but they didn't invent it, I don't think. Well, Pudgy did comment. He said uh, well, that Al's on Taylor does what they do is distinct from other Italian beef sandwiches, but others which are similar. Probably because of that spicing. Yeah, I know some people really dislike it, um, and some people love it. Um, it's it's uh, it definitely stands out, um, and um, you know I mentioned some people. I remember back on LTH, people were, I think it's uh, all spice, and I can absolutely understand uh, thinking it uh, is all spice because all spice really does taste like those other spices together. But when you smell um, the the a beef sandwich from Al's, I think you get a distinct hit of cloves. Um, in, I'll have to pay attention aroma, better. In the aroma. Um, and there's definitely cinnamon there too, I think. Uh, uh, now, Carrie Shook asked the other side of that coin, what's the least acceptable Italian beef? Well, there's lots of them out there. Yeah, okay. that yeah, I I don't know. I I I mean I've I've always gone on recommendations and and that, uh, um, and I'm pretty I'm pretty finicky about um, any sort of food that is um, is Italian or is purported to be Italian. I don't eat out much such things because I very often have been disappointed. That's hardly ever I'll eat pasta out. If I need oh, pasta, yeah. I make it. Um, and yeah. I, I would be afraid of anybody who innocently served you carbonara with peas and <laughs> cream. <laughs> well, one, 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 one shouldn't be uh, too much of a purist. I mean, you can make a lovely dish of pasta with cream and peas and, and eggs. In fact, there is a, a, a fancy uh, a dish from, uh, from Rome, uh, a la paparina. Um, which actually has those things in it, but it's not carbonara. carbonara. Okay, well, Steve, Steve did point out, and you know, since we mentioned LTH, he did make a link to one person's list of, of Italian beef sandwiches he ate in Chicago, but it's not like what happened around, what, 2005, 2006, when there was this systematic approach to trying Italian beef sandwiches conducted by people at LTH. This guy is, you know. The beefathon. The beefathon that had many, many meetings. And you yes. said you participated in the one that was in your neighborhood. Yeah, I just the uh, the West Side uh, Taylor Street uh, part of it. And uh, they were they were not so exciting, the two places here. Who knew back then those were the good old days? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Tony, I want to thank you very, very much. Uh, I'm glad we finally could make it. And if you consider the weather today and the road conditions, if we had to meet somewhere, it probably wouldn't have happened. We would have had to postpone again. But the miracle of Zoom, we got to meet and talk and have our friends. I think there's somebody from Iowa, Maryland, uh, our friend up in the UP. It's great. So let's get together and have lunch, probably after the holidays. Sure, that would be great. 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 So ha uh, happy Thanksgiving, and uh, we'll meet again. You know, you got if you got our email, you got the schedule. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank for you, coming. Tony. Thank you. Bye bye.